Coming up next, social distancing turned into social gatherings this past football weekend, as police are now investigating giant apartment parties in State College. Plus, how a childhood friend's story helped one woman create new opportunities for those in prison. And we remember the accomplishments of a Penn State sports legend, a leader on and off the court. The Center County Report starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Hunter Pitkoff. Thanks for joining us for the Center County Report. And I'm Emily Kyler. Our top story, State College and Penn State Police will be on alert this weekend. With a big football game tomorrow, they're worried about a repeat of last weekend's party problems downtown. Caitlin Frollo has the story. As Penn State played Indiana, the party crowd came out last weekend. Hundreds of people, many of them students, gathered in downtown State College apartment complexes, including the Rise, the Here, and Penn Tower. In violation of local COVID ordinance, video quickly hit social media. John Arbach was one of the first to post videos from the atrium of the Rise. People in general have the right to know what's going on in their community, especially if it has some kind of effect on them. The large gatherings prompted concern among many in the community. The Rise emailed its residents that all amenities will be closed this weekend, and Penn Tower has since closed its upper deck until further notice. Penn State has reported nearly 3,800 COVID cases among students since August. To put things into perspective, I'm standing right across the street from the Rise apartment complex in Eastview Terrace, which is where Penn State students with COVID-19 are currently isolating. State College Police and the University are now working to identify people at the gatherings through social media and surveillance video. Those identified may be cited and referred to the Office of Student Conduct for other sanctions. Penn State President Eric Barron called the gatherings reckless and irresponsible while encouraging residents of the buildings to be tested. We asked the borough's assistant manager why police didn't cite people at the scene rather than having to rely on later video identifications. He told us safety not citations, is the priority. This past weekend, if you want to call it a quote-unquote test run, we failed. It's not about, you know, getting fine revenue or writing citations and yelling at students. No, it's about limiting their social gatherings, limiting that, that, that close contact. The borough's latest numbers, which include last weekend, showed 17 emergency ordinance violations reported to police and six citations issued. In State College, I'm Caitlin Frollo for the Center County Report. The borough currently has no plans to change the ordinance in place. Tomorrow's Penn State game against Ohio State would normally be the whiteout game, with tens of thousands of fans pouring into town. But it'll look a lot different this time. Penn State's annual whiteout game is considered one of the best atmospheres in college sports. But the sea of white spread across Beaver Stadium will be non-existent tomorrow. Only the teams, coaches, Players, families, and select media members will be allowed inside the stadium as the Nittany Lions host Ohio State. You won't see fans lined up outside Beaver Stadium on Saturday, but the university is encouraging the Penn State community to show to the team on virtually and keep the whiteout tradition going. Penn State Athletics Marketing Director P.J. Mullen says there will be artificial crowd noise playing through the speakers and videos of fans cheering on the team on the big board in hopes of recreating some of the energy. It, it certainly won't be... Uh, Beaver Stadium. You're not going to hit, you know, all the five senses that you typically get when you're at Beaver Stadium, but you'll certainly uh, feel it a little bit and hear it at the very least. Police will be keeping an eye outside to make sure no one gathers around the stadium. Tailgating is not allowed. There will be three official outdoor watch parties for students on campus. Others will try to find a spot at downtown bars and restaurants, but for most people, it won't be the same. During the week, you can always kind of feel the anticipation and this year, I guess, not being able to go, um, it, it just doesn't feel quite the same. ESPN's College Game Day is also in State College for the fourth straight year. The show will air inside Beaver Stadium, away from fans. We have some breaking news right now. Today, new COVID numbers are expected any moment for Center County. The total as of yesterday was 4,184 cases here since March. The total number of deaths in Center County remains at 16. After a recent rise in COVID-19 hospitalizations in Center County, free COVID testing has returned to the Nittany Mall. That's where the state set up a drive-through testing site earlier this month. 
Now it's open again, this time inside the former Bonton store. The site has been open since Tuesday and is scheduled to run until November 14th. Just four days away in the presidential race, it's been more than 550 days since Joe Biden announced his campaign in April 2019. And the race for the White House has been a leading news story well before then. It's been a long stretch. In fact, too much for many people. Reporter Joe Skinner looks at election exhaustion. If you're tired of all the political ads and are starting to tune out, you're not alone. Myself, my family, most of my friends, when we're watching television, we change the channel or, or mute it when, when a campaign ad comes on. because It's just like, we really have to listen to this again. With the presidential election only four days away, a year and a half's worth of campaigning will finally come to an end on Tuesday. Ads, debates, speeches, and photo ops. Here in Battleground State, Pennsylvania, it's almost impossible to turn on the TV and avoid the negative ads. Penn State student Mike Walro says he wants to keep the spotlight on the issues, but it can start to get exhausting. When you talk about politics for so long all the time, I think people just kind of get tired of it. And it's a shame because, like, voting is a very important civic duty. According to a Pew Research study before the 2016 presidential election, nearly 6 in 10 people said constant election coverage wore them out. Many said too much attention was on candidates' comments and personal lives and not enough on the issues. Despite the frustration, voter turnout has increased in each presidential and midterm election since 2012 and is expected to surpass the 2016 total again on Tuesday. Clark says even though the ads can be annoying, the important result is getting people out to vote. I do like the push for voting and how easy um, corporations uh, have made it for, for their employees or for their customers to find resources to register. I'm Joe Skinner for the Center County Report. The polls will be open on Tuesday from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. We'll bring you live election coverage on TV and our social media channels that night. It's been cold and rainy this week, but sunnier skies might be in store as we get ready to flip the calendar to November. Salix will have the seven-day forecast coming up. Also ahead, a Penn State sports legend has died. We take a look at his lasting impact on and off the court. More after this break. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Get caught buzz driving, and you could do some hard time. Craig, knock it off. Sorry, Mom. It could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And that could set you back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. One thing you can never have sex without. It's consent. Because sex without it isn't sex. It's rape. It's on us to stop sexual assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're going to take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, I am a witness and so are you. For people in prison, getting an education is difficult. If not, impossible. But a Penn State professor is trying to change that and make a positive difference. Ariel Simpson tells you about the Prison Journalism Project. 
A college education isn't cheap. Penn State students and their families spend tens of thousands of dollars to get a diploma and a top-notch education. For many others, education itself seems out of reach for many reasons, from personal obstacles to poverty to prison. At prison similar to the one behind me, a proper education is hard to come by. There are about 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States. That's about the size of the population of Baltimore, and 41% of these incarcerated people do not hold a high school diploma. Those numbers are what led Shaheen Pasha to make a positive impact. That and something she experienced herself. It wasn't until actually my um, my best friend, my childhood best friend, um, was you know arrested and incarcerated, and he was actually incarcerated for 127 years. The Penn State professor says that's when it hit her. It kind of showed me this whole other world that I didn't know, and it really... It was very personal to me. She launched the self-funded prison journalism project to focus on teaching journalism to inmates. And it's now grown even through the pandemic, now reaching more than 100 writers in 28 states. When the pandemic hit, we realized that we were all isolated. So the men and women inside were completely forgotten. So we launched this publication just very ad hoc on Medium. And word got out. We partnered with a few different organizations. And next thing I know, we were flooded with material. Prisoners must handwrite letters and send them to a virtual post office box. Volunteers receive scans and later publish them to the website. Former inmate Christopher Etienne served five plus years in prison where he earned his GED, then entered Columbia University's documentary program. He continues to contribute to the Prison Journalism Project with more dynamic clips. Lock in as you're locked out of existence, locked out of society, and locked out of social consciousness. He realizes no matter what, an inmate's past may follow them forever. When I sat down and I looked at where my life was taking me, I realized at the end of the day, I'm probably always going to be considered an ex-con. But Etienne believes the project will help inmates to learn and also make sure they're not a forgotten piece of society. Giving the individual that opportunity to tell their own stories or share their works or just like put their feelings and emotions out there you may empathize with them as a human, as a person. Pasha hopes more people will learn about the Prison Journalism Project so it can continue to expand nationwide. I'm Ariel Simpson for the Center County Report. Right now, the Prison Journalism Project is working on textbooks and a best of 2020 book for inmates. Penn State has lost a sports legend. Former two-sport athlete Jesse Arnell passed away last week at the age of 86. Christopher Hess has more on Arnell's legacy. Trailblazer, humanitarian, student, and athlete. Those are just some of the adjectives to describe Jesse Arnell. Last Wednesday, Arnell passed away at the age of 86. As a 1955 graduate of Penn State with a degree in political science, Arnell excelled on the football field, on the basketball court, and in the classroom. He was a defensive end on Rip Engel's teams of the 1950s, but his athletic talents were at their peak on the hardwood, where he went on to become Penn State basketball's all-time leading scorer with 2,138 points. He now sits third behind Taylor Battle and Lamar Stevens. Penn State sports historian Lou Prado says Arnell's abilities on the court showed what kind of leader he was. They went on to, uh, to, to be the captain of the team and All-American honors. The only Penn State player ever went first team All-American. Though Arnell's athletic talents were great, his off-the-field accomplishments were revolutionary. Arnell was the first African-American to hold the title of student body president, as well as the first African-American member and chair of the Board of Trustees. He was also a Navy veteran and a lawyer. A number of scholarships in his and his wife's name are also yes. awarded to students in the colleges of the Liberal Arts, Health and Human Development, and the Dickinson School of Law. Prado says Arnell's athletic and scholastic achievements have put him into an elite category of Penn State figures. Jesse Arnell will be remembered as one of the great Penn State athletes and students and, po and graduates alumni in Penn State's history. In State College, I'm Christopher Hess for the Center County Report. A more formal and traditional ceremony to celebrate Arnell's life will be held later after COVID-19 subsides.
Good afternoon. I'm Sally Iverson here with your Friday afternoon forecast. Looking out at Beaver Stadium, a very overcast sky right now, and maybe even a couple of drops of rain. Currently feeling like 43 degrees with a north wind at 6 miles per hour. Temperatures across the rest of the central portion of Pennsylvania showing pretty much sticking in the mid to upper 40s for us here in central PA. And looking across the rest of the state, that seems to be the trend as well, with temperatures sitting right around that 40 degree mark. If we want to look at our current radar and satellite, like I had mentioned, there are a couple of raindrops um, moving over the state college area, maybe even some snow flurries, flurries right around that northern tier of Pennsylvania. Looking at our future cast, we'll see that they, we may get even some more drops of rain right around that dinner time hour, but the clouds and the rain will clear out as we head into the overnight hours tonight and into tomorrow. So as you wake up for tomorrow, Halloween and game day, a very clear sky throughout much of Pennsylvania. Looking ahead through towards the rest of the day, again, the sun will remain in the sky for the rest of the evening uh, or for the day, and then a clear sky well into the evening right around kickoff. Some clouds will move in Sunday during the uh, morning hours and overnight, and then this will be our next chance for some rain as it makes its way east, impacting us on Sunday. Now your forecast for today, 46, overcast with some showers, and tonight a very chilly night, 26 degrees and partly cloudy, so we're about 10 degrees below average. Looking at our whiteout forecast, sunny tomorrow and remaining clear as we head into the kickoff, 44 at 5 p.m., 40 at 7.30, and cooling down to 37 by 10 p.m. Looking at our seven-day forecast, again, some sun tomorrow before the showers return on Sunday, and then heading towards the rest of next week. It won't be like this week. It will actually pre be pretty sunny as we head into the rest of next week. And now we'll bring it over to David in sports. Thanks, Alex. Penn State has its home opener tomorrow, but how will it be for the Nittany Lions playing with no fans and without Noah Kane? We'll preview the game next. Also coming up, how are new head coaches adjusting to a new job in the middle of a pandemic? That's next after this break. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. And as soon as I start to make my breakfast, Hamilton is right there. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I mean, look at this little face. How do you not love him? The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. They said I couldn't dream called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. I'm David Hadar with sports. Penn State suffered its first opening season loss since 2015, dropping a heartbreaker at Indiana last week. The Nittany Lions look to avoid the same fate tomorrow when they host Ohio State. Josh Starr is live at Beaver Stadium with more on the big game. Josh? Thanks, David. I'm outside Beaver Stadium where number 18 Penn State will kick off against number three Ohio State tomorrow. Now, last week, Penn State was plagued by mistakes and penalties that won't play this week against Ohio State. 
Now, Penn State will have to come home with an 0-1 record, more missing pieces, and have to face off against one of the country's best teams. Penn State will be without another important piece in its backfield tomorrow against Ohio State. Running back Noah Kane left the week one loss at Indiana with an injury and will be out for the remainder of the season. That leaves sophomore Devin Ford, who will get the bulk of the carries, and freshman Kevon Lee and Keziah Holmes in the backfield. Even without Journey Brown and Noah Kane, Coach James Franklin says last week's loss didn't have to do with missing pieces. We, we played hard. You know, we, we played with passion. We just we didn't always play smart. We'll obviously learn uh, from some of the mistakes that we made in, in week one, and we're going to have to. Starting linebacker Jesse Lucchetta will also be sidelined for the first half after he was called for targeting against Indiana. Franklin said the team will feel that loss against the Buckeyes offense that scored 52 points last week against Nebraska. To beat this type of team, it's not going to be pieces. It's, it's going to be a hole. One of Penn State's biggest preseason strengths, its running backs, is now down to three players with a combined 83 career carries. Getting them going will be key for Penn State in its first home game without fans. Ohio State coach Ryan Day says the whiteout normally makes it hard to communicate, but the atmosphere will be different this year. Penn State is one of two teams in the Big Ten East to beat Ohio State since 2014. But that win came in a Beaver Stadium full of fans, not cardboard. College game day is here for one of the best college football matchups this week in the nation. Now, for Penn State to win that matchup, it's going to be key to take care of the football. Last week, with three turnovers in Indiana, Sean Clifford will have to try to take more care of that football. You can catch the game on Penn State's Com Radio with kickoff at 7.30. I'm Josh Starr for the Center County Report, live from Beaver Stadium. Back to David in the studio. Thanks, Josh. Today I had a chance to talk with Tom Rinaldi from ESPN's College Game Day about coming back to Penn State and the message he hopes to send fans in his heartwarming feature stories. They get a sense of the journey of a player beyond just the performance on the field. Uh, when you watch the Nittany Lions play, you can see the excellence at so many positions. You can see the future NFL stars and and how they represent the fan base in delivering victories and contending for Big Ten titles and trying to reach the college football playoff, all of those things. But each and every one of those players has walked his own incredible path, typically, to get there. And the opportunity to try to tap into that, not only to show people what that path has been, but to tap in, David, to the aspiration of where that player also is striving to go in representing his team, playing for his brothers, playing for his school, and then hoping that he might be able to play on Sundays and help his family in that situation. That aspiration has great energy, and it's, it's got great inspiration around it. What do you think their chances are of, uh, of pulling off an upset tomorrow, similar to how they did in 2016? To take nothing away from Indiana and the incredible, incredible play which will now be indelible, at least in this season, of stretching out and touching the pylon, whether it did or did not break the plane with the point of the ball. But Penn State dominated the game in every metric uh, until its very conclusion. So with that, knowing that, yes, there's the disappointment of loss, but now there's the great blessing of opportunity right away to have the chance to play the team everyone regards as the standard bearer, not just in the division of the conference, but in the conference overall. And think about what a win would mean. Not only would it absolutely flush away the memory of that week one loss, but now suddenly with the uncertainty of not knowing how many games are going to be played, David, how many games might be canceled, the, the meaning of this win can't be overstated if Penn State is able to achieve it. High school football playoffs are here, and several local teams are going up against some formidable opponents. Here are tonight's matchups. State High already lost to Harrisburg on Monday, so they won't be playing on Friday. 
but three and three Belfont will take on four and one Juniata. After losing to Belfont last week, Phillipsburg Osceola will square off against non-conference opponent Northern Cambria. And tomorrow, undefeated Tyrone plays undefeated Central as a playoff game in Mansion Park Stadium in Altoona. While sports continue despite COVID-19, the journey here has been different. Reporter Ariel Simpson looks at the adjustments newly hired coaches needed to make this year. The state high field hockey team is one of many fall sports making its return to play in the presence of COVID-19. The team was without a head coach for six months before Sharon Herlocker stepped in to take over in May. Herlocker has previous coaching experience, but leading a new program in the wake of a pandemic has brought new challenges. We've been going step by step since since July. In July, they allowed us to do a modified summer tra- optional summer training. And then slowly we've gotten more and more freedom, so to speak. Whether you're coaching on the field hockey field or at the ballpark, newly hired coaches, no matter what sport or what level, have been thrown in the new challenge of coaching a new program all while during a pandemic. I don't know if anybody was really prepared to, to coach during a pandemic um, or we're, I don't think any of us are prepared for anything that it brings. But but honestly, I, I do think my um, experience has has helped me just in general. Crowell brings 18 years of coaching experience to Penn State, but has never had a season like this one. I think the connectedness piece has really been what we've what we've missed, that in-person connection. I would say that that has been the biggest challenge. While the pandemic may have put new obstacles in their paths, both Crowell and Herlocker welcome these new challenges. Roadblocks happen in life, so it just happens to be happening right now. With Penn State softball set to restart in the spring and state high field hockey already underway, all that these coaches can do is roll with the changes. In State College, I'm Ariel Simpson for the Center County Report. Week 8 of the NFL season features both the Steelers and Eagles playing in divisional matchups. Pittsburgh makes the trip to AFC North rival Baltimore for the team's first meeting of the season. The Steelers are the lone undefeated team, while the Ravens sit just a game back at 5-1. and one. Just up by 95, the Eagles host the Cowboys in prime time on Sunday night football. Philadelphia is in first place in the NFC East with a 2-4-1 record and looks to stave off a struggling Dallas squad. Mike McCarthy's team could be on its third string quarterback and the defense has given up the most points in the league this season. That's all for sports. Now back to you at the anchor desk. Coming up next, it's me, Mario, or at least someone dressed like him. This man is turning downtown state college into rainbow road. Find out why after the break. Wow. These are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. I rescued Toast from a shelter in 2011. I love Toast because she's a lazy diva. Toast does whatever she wants, obviously. She's sleeping right now. She's an epic snuggler. She's so comforting. She's so loving. Toast makes me laugh. (laughs) When I walked into the shelter, I knew right then that she was special. Okay, Simon, what do people wear? Clothes. That's right. So it's important to learn how to dress yourself. Here's how it's done. Shirt, underwear, pants, socks, shoes. Underwear, always first, name tag on the back. Then pants and shirt. Go ahead and put this on. Now with the shirt, you want to make sure the first button's right or you have to start all over again, okay? Socks left on left, right on right. Tying the shoes, we're going to take the laces, we're going to cross them over, we're going to turn around where the bunny goes down in the hole, pull it tight, and bunny ears. Got it? Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day making sure they brush is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. 
Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Remember Nintendo's Mario Kart? Well, nearly 30 years after its initial release, one man is bringing the game to life in State College. Joshua Schaefer is from Chicago and has been driving all around the country since buying his go-kart in June. With his Mario costume, speakers playing Mario Kart music, and free rides he gives to people who ask, he's gone viral. People kept saying it looked like a Mario Kart, and that gave me the idea to just buy the shirt, the hat, play the music, and throw a doll on the front. I've been on like several TV news stations. I've been to a couple children's hospitals. Like I've just been spreading love everywhere I go. This wants to make people smile. And that's all for today's newscast. You can find more of our stories on our website, centercountyreport.com. Our next newscast is on Tuesday, but you can follow us anytime for breaking news. That's on Twitter, at centercountyrep, or on our Facebook page. We also have a Center County Report Instagram. Have a good weekend.